All right, thanks. So, uh, previous talk was intentionally very general, and it seemed to have divided you pretty much in half. So, first half liked it, and the other half was so so. Well, I have good news for you. This is uh, a lot more technical, and uh, I'm actually going to show you some code during this. So, the topic is uh, how to keep business logic out of your UI, and it kind of uh, connects pretty well with Peter's previous code uh, talk as well. So, let's get started. So, what is business logic? Uh, this is something that uh, I guess all developers use this term, but uh, there might be diff small differences in what is business logic and what isn't. So, this is uh, how I look at it, and I based my presentation on this definition of business logic. So, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, an information system exists to solve a real-world problem, because otherwise uh, there's not really any use for that system. Uh, well, games uh, might be the exception there, but anyway. So, a real-world uh, problem, so you could basically split it up into static parts and dynamic parts. The static parts are like the things, concepts, customer, order, patient, journal, and so on. And then the dynamic parts are like events that happen that the system needs to react to, processes that you need to carry on, customer onboarding process, like things, moving parts. And uh, in order to actually be able to solve this, these real-world problems, uh, we use a, a, an abstraction of it that we call a, a model. This is the domain model. Because the problem that we're solving, that's the problem domain, so we have a model of it. And uh, the static parts of this domain model, they are normally the easy ones. So they are the entities, the data structures, and so on. Those are pretty straightforward. Uh, but then we have the dynamic parts of the model, and they are pretty easily forgotten. I mean, it uh, uh, might be that it's uh, slightly more challenging to actually model and document these dynamic parts than just drawing some static class diagrams. That could be the reason why a lot of uh, emphasis is being put on the static part, and then you will sort of do the dynamic parts with your left hand as you go along. And uh, what I mean about business logic is this dynamic part. So, so the, the, the code that may drives the business forward, that brings the customer business value. So that's what I mean by business logic. Uh, before we go on, I have this little disclaimer here. So business logic creeping into the UI. Uh, it's not necessarily an architectural problem, so uh, you can't necessarily design your way around it. If your developers aren't disciplined enough, they can still manage to move business logic into the UI. But uh, during this talk, I'm going to show you uh, a concrete architectural design pattern that makes it slightly easier to prevent this from happening. It doesn't make it impossible, but uh, it makes it easier, and we've tried it out in a project that suffered from this project, and uh, the project is not finished yet, but uh, the results are, in my opinion, quite good. So, <coughs> moving on. This is the classic architecture, the one that uh, Peter also showed you. And this is a good tried and true architecture. Uh, the only thing that's missing from this model is, uh, is the DTO layer. I intentionally left it out. And uh, smaller applications, this is normally uh, good enough. So, uh, we got the UI layer on top. Vardin. Then we have service layers. Uh, we could have a DTO layer there as well. We got some entities. We got a persistence layer, JPA, and then we got the SQL database. Uh, there are a couple of problems with this approach if you're not uh, paying attention. Uh, this is the first one. Uh, this is uh, one that I've run into on more than one occasion. And uh, this is uh, basically when you have a UI operation that needs to invoke multiple components. So you want to do something there, and then you get the result, and you want to do something there, and then you get the result, and then you want to do something there. So uh, it's, uh, it's very easy to accidentally end up implementing this within, let's say, your UI. So you might have a, a click listener, or a menu command listener, or a presenter method, or whatever you're doing, and then you start implementing these calls there. So first you you get the uh, data from that service over there, and then you pass it to that service over there, and then you finally pass it to that service over there. All right, so this is fine, uh, straightforward code, everything works. The only problem here, uh, where well, there are more than one problem here, but uh, the m maybe the most serious one is the transaction boundary. So, for example, let's say that these services are now EGBs, 
that means they are transactional. And each service call would run in its own transaction in this case. So uh, if everything goes fine, this will work as intended. So first you invoke service one, it will commit, then you do the data, then you invoke service two, it commits, and then you do service three, it commits. But let's say in this case the service two fails. So then you wouldn't end, you wouldn't call service three, but service one has already been committed, and now you have inconsistencies in your database. Because actually the sort of logical transaction boundary should be the entire UI operation. Uh, but in practice, since the developers, uh, maybe they weren't aware of this, uh, it's actually three different transactions going on within this same UI logical operation. This is one problem uh, with that type of approach. Uh, this is another problem that also happens. So uh, if you concentrate too much on CRUD on your service layer, so you only have methods for creating data, retrieving, updating, and deleting. That basically means that the business logic is now moved to the head of the user. So uh, let's say, uh, as an example, we have a, an employee database, and uh, some, you have to fire somebody. If you have a CRUD-based register, you'd have to sort of manually go in, then you'd have to look up the, the employee, then you open it, then you look for the um, termination date field, you enter the termination field, you save, then you go to the other system, you look for the user in your Active Directory database, you disable the account, then you go to, to your office system, something, you write a letter of recommendation, and all kind of stuff. So basically what this means, this is clearly a business process, right? So this uh, employee termination. There are lots of steps that need to be carried out in different order, and uh, since our system only supports CRUD, we basically moved the business logic into the head of the user. Or we might have moved it to the UI layer because, hey, the service layer only supports create, update, retrieve, and delete. This is another problem that uh, I've run into. Third problem. <coughs> uh, let's say we got uh, one service that returns uh, different, uh, let's say, DTOs, for example. And then we've got uh, three different UI components that need slightly different versions of the same data. So instead of creating uh, new DTO services, you end up adding methods to this one service. So you might have some methods over there that's used by UI1, and then a couple of hundred lines down, you have some methods that's returned by UI2, and then you have some methods that are used by UI1 again, and then you end up adding UI3, and then the class grows and grows and grows and grows and grows and grows, and all of a sudden you have 3,000 lines of code in a single AGB, which are almost the same. They are, they are working on the same data, they are returning slightly different detail, or they are expecting slightly different parameters. I can see some people nodding here. Apparently, I'm not the only one who has experienced this. So uh, this is one problem. Then we have this following one. So uh, now you've actually you've done your homework. So you actually use proper services. You try to put your business logic into your services. Now you end up in a situation that, hmm, I need to implement a new business logic method. But where should I put it? Because I could fit it into both service A and service B. So I just sort of uh, flip a coin and see whichever service I end up adding it to. So uh, eventually we're going to have two services that sort of overlap each other because they contain some logic over here, and then we have some logic there, and then we have some logic here again, and logic there, and so on. This is also something that I've seen. Uh, obviously, uh, in this case, if you run into this, you should probably create a service C and add the method over there. So <clears throat> these are just four problems. I, I'm sure there are more problems you can think of, but these are the four ones that I've experienced myself personally. So what can we do about this? Uh, first thing, uh, this is good to stress uh, so that all your team members are aware of this. Think about where the transaction boundaries are. So where does a transaction start, where does it end, and what's inside of it? And uh, the way I like to see it is uh, 
that the transaction boundary should go between the UI layer and the backend. So as soon as you cross over from the UI to the backend server, regardless of if it's running in the same VM or if it's a remote call, then that's the transaction boundary. So when your backend call starts, the transaction starts, and when you move back, the transaction ends. It can end before that as well, and actually it can start within the backend layer as well. If you want to do something outside of the transaction, then you want to do something inside the transaction, then you want to do something outside again. That's perfectly fine. The point is that the transaction doesn't start on the UI layer. Uh, I've seen a UI code, for example, in Spring, where they have used sort of transactional uh, button click listeners and so on. So which would basically mean that the UI is responsible for starting the transaction and committing or rolling it back. So uh, my rules of thumb that I try to play, uh, use in all my projects is that uh, one UI operation, one backend call. So uh, basically, uh, a call to the backend when I click a button or do something, it's a one-liner uh, if you exclude the error checking. Uh, probably you want to have some kind of, of uh, try-catch block, or, or then you have a generic error handler somewhere that handles the situation where the backend call doesn't work. But the, the rule of thumb, one backend call. So in that first example where we had three different services, uh, I would have some kind of a facade service in front that takes all the necessary information and then performs, invokes all those three services within the backend layer. Uh, another rule of thumb that I try to follow is that like one backend call, one transaction. Uh, there are uh, exceptions to that rule. Let's say you have some kind of auditing system. So you want to store a trace regardless of the transaction is committed or not. So then you'd have to have actually two transactions. So one transaction for the audit log and another transaction for your business operation. But anyway, sort of uh, from the UI point of view, it's like a one, one backend call, one transaction. So no long-running transactions that you have to maintain state in the UI. It's, uh, well, it's technically possible, but it makes your life miserable. And then finally, one transaction, one thread. So uh, for example, in, at least in Spring, probably in EGB2, the transactions are scoped to the current thread. So you can't start a transaction, then fire off another thread, and then fire maybe a second thread and expect them to uh, participate in the same transaction because then you'd have to keep track of which thread finishes first so that you can commit and roll back and so on. It becomes all too complex. Try to design your system in such a way that, uh, that uh, the transaction is uh, sort of uh, isolated to uh, one thread only. And uh, one good sort of... Uh, way to do this is imagine that your backend is running on a remote machine over a very, very slow network. You want to minimize the traffic between the UI and the backend because every, every backend call uh, is costly. It has a cost. And if you only have a few users, well, that, doesn't may, that may not be much. But then let's say you have 10,000 users, then uh, 500 milliseconds uh, times uh, 100,000 users, that's pretty much. So try to think, even if you're, you're designing your system to be running as a monolithic system on the same VM, imagine that your backend is running on a remote machine with a, a slow network. So you want to minimize the calls there. Make them as coarse grain as possible. Then next thing, when you have thought about the transactions, you want to take care of your services. So uh, you should strive for highly cohesive services. So that basically means that uh, each service should concentrate on one thing only and do that well. So uh, a naming is pretty important here. So uh, in very many examples, uh, for mine including, uh, you can see stuff like customer service, order service. Uh, in my opinion, that might actually not be a very good idea because it's very general. I mean, a customer service, it can contain anything related to customers, right? So that means that this is a good candidate for a service that will grow, and it will grow, and it will grow, and it will grow. And uh, let's just say that when you have EGBs with have, that have more than 1,000 lines of code, it's, uh, it's really a pain when you need to do some changes to it. Uh, I've been there, done that. 
So uh, try to, to figure out uh, like more specific names, like customer onboarding. That sort of uh, immediately tells you that, OK, so this service contains the business logic for customer onboarding. And then you could have a, 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 like a, another one for a, well firing service when you're kicking somebody out, or, or whatever you want to call it. As you can see, I'm also sort of uh, I didn't include the service suffix here. It's a matter of, of personal choice. Sometimes it can actually help to have this service suffix, because then you know on which level in the system you're on. Sometimes it just makes the code harder to read if it's sort of obvious that the customer onboarding is a service. So that's a, you don't necessarily always need to add the suffixes just for the sake of adding the suffixes. But that's a, that's a side note. So. Um, if you are adding a new service method, so you know you need to implement something, and then you don't really know where to add it. You could add it here, or you could add it there, or you don't really find any place where you can logically add it, then you should probably create a completely new service or rethink your structure. Are you doing this right? This is a good indication that there's something in your code that needs to be redesigned. If you can't immediately pick that, yes. That's the one. That's exactly where I'm going to add this piece of business logic. It belongs right here. If it doesn't, you probably need to rethink something. And uh, you could come up with some pretty interesting new ways of looking at a problem if you realize this. If you try to sort of step one step back and think about it, are there any different ways we could do it? Then you can get a Eureka. And uh, then it will, uh, again, your project will take a large step forward. Uh, this is something that um, I wouldn't do this sort of first. It's not on the top of my list. No, it's not something for all projects, but it's something that sometimes might be a good idea. And that is to separate the reading and writing. So instead of having a single service which has both save, delete, update, and all the get and find, you separate them into two different components, or even more components. So uh, you might even have, a, a, for complex UIs, complex screens, you might even end up with a sort of service per UI implementation, where you have like a DTO service, for example, as, as Peter showed us, uh, for each view. And then you have a separate central component for actually saving and updating stuff. Uh, this allows for some neat optimizations uh, down the road, which I'm going to show you in a minute when we go through. A, uh, a sort of hands-on pattern for doing this. And then we have this avoid uh, only CRUD services. So uh, a lot of our systems have to do with sort of creating, retrieving, updating data. Uh, but if it's a, a more complex system than just an address book or, or some kind of master data administration, you probably want to have more sort of specific methods than just create, retrieve, update, delete. Because otherwise, you will very easily end up in a situation where you're actually moving the business logic into the head of the user. So the user has to keep in mind what data to look for, what changes to do, when to do it, and why, instead of sort of having, uh, letting the system deal with these processes. And now we're going to look at a really concrete uh, pattern for doing this. So this is a command-based architecture. Uh, I've tried this out in one large project where we had this problem with, with business logic creeping into the UI. And it's actually helped. The quality of the code has increased. And it's a slightly different way of, of approaching uh, building enterprise applications than this traditional service-based uh, architecture, even though you can sort of pretty easily trans transform a service-based application to a command-based application, because you can still use the same bits and pieces. You're just doing them, using them in a slightly different way. So uh, instead of thinking in terms of services, you should think in terms of commands and queries. So forget about all these uh, customer onboarding ordering service, employee service. Think about the, what the system actually does. Why is the system there? So a command, that's an operation where you tell the system to do something. And it's, a, or, or it's often uh, this command should 
should be more than save this user because then you're back to CRUD again. Then you don't necessarily need a command-based system. But if you have like a terminate employee contract, that's a good command name. It's a, a clear business process. The start of a business process it involves different, different things. A command may return a result. It doesn't require to because uh, different commands might be different things. Let's say you have a, a GPS tracking system. Let's say you have a taxi central. All the taxis are sending their GPS signals every 10 seconds. It doesn't really matter if one of those messages get lost, right? So you don't really need to wait for confirmation that, OK, did I actually save my position? Because I'm going to send it in 10 seconds anyway. So uh, for those type, but still, it's a command, store my position. So it will insert a row in the database or something with the timestamp and the coordinates. But I don't care if it succeeds or not, because I'm going to redo it anyway. Whereas other commands uh, are really important that you know that did they succeed or did they not. Then we have queries. You ask the system for specific data. So a query always returns something, even though it's an empty result. and uh, uh, Queries basically fails because of external runtime errors. So if the network is done or the, the hard drive has failed or something. Uh, I mean, if you ask permission, if you ask for customers and you don't have permission to see those customers, you will just get an empty list back, for example. So a query uh, always returns data. And these commands and queries, they can be both synchronous or asynchronous. So if you have a a fast command, you can just send it, and then you can wait for it to return. There it comes back, and then you can move on. Or then you can just send it away and do something else, and then after a while, they will get a response. Same thing goes for queries. And uh, in terms of, of coding this, um, you can model both commands and queries as separate classes. So uh, the query or command class. The name should be a verb It's in its imperative form. So uh, find customers, that would be one query object. Terminate employee contract, that's a command. And the parameters for this operation, you would model them as class, class attributes. For example, if we have a create patient command, when a new patient arrives uh, at a doctor's reception, the minimum information we want would be, for example, birth date, first name, last name, gender, something like that. So these would all be fields within your command class. And uh, if you're using Java, you could sort of make a, add a generic parameter for the result. I'm going to show you a code example of this later. And uh, if possible, you could try to make this class immutable. So once you've created a query object or once you've created a command object, you can't change it afterwards. This makes it a lot easier to transfer it over network wires. You can share it between threads. Uh, there's no risk in, in, in the object being changed in the middle, especially if you're, you're storing it in some kind of cache, for maybe if you have some kind of store and forward procedure if the backend is down. So it's a, a lot. your life will become easier if you make this immutable. Uh, in some occasions, you may want to turn your DTOs even into commands, especially if you're sort of sending them back to the server, in which case you can't make them immutable. But uh, that's, uh, that's maybe one of the exceptions. Also, uh, another uh, good, good uh, thing about having these uh, immutable commands or queries is that uh, if you mark those fields final, the only place where you can actually populate those fields is in the constructor. Then you can add some kind of basic validation inside of your constructor, which basically means that it's impossible to construct an invalid command. It's impossible to construct an invalid query. Of course, there might still be a validation that needs to be done in, in terms of checking with databases. Does this exist? Uh, but in terms of format, you can sort of make sure that a command always, it, you can't create a command unless it in, contain, contains all the required fields. Or you can't create a query unless all the parameters are in the correct form. So this sort of uh, reduces the risks for errors as well. But this is an example, uh, some kind of UML. Um, 
I'm not sure that this uh, generic parameter is proper UML, but I think you see what I mean. So uh, this is a command class. Uh, the command name is create patient. The result of this command is a patient object that could be a DTO, it could be an entity, depending on how many abstraction layers you have. Uh, as you can see, in order to be able to create a patient, we will need a first name, last name, gender, and birth date. So if one of these is missing, we can't enter this uh, patient into the system. On the other hand, we have find orders. This is a query. It returns a list of orders. Order, again, could be an entity or DTO. Uh, we need a from and a to date, because we don't want to return all the orders, because we might get thousands or hundreds of thousands of them. We're only interested in, in the orders within a specific time span. And then we have an optional attribute customer. So in case we only want to retrieve the orders for this particular customer, we can pass this customer in the object. If we leave it out, we will return all the orders. So in code, it would look like something like that. So create patient implements. We have a marker command there. Final fields, constructor. Here I have a require not null check in the constructor so that you can make sure that uh, the required attributes are actually there. Find order, same thing. And here you can see that I have actually different constructors uh, for the different types of queries. So if I want to uh, invoke a query using a customer, I can use that constructor. And if I don't want to, then I can use another constructor, or I can just pass in null. But I don't like to pass null to methods. I like to, to design the API in such a way that I don't need to pass a null object anymore. That, that's just me. All right, implementation. Uh, so technically, the queries and uh, commands, they are implemented in the same way. So they are just POJOs, immutable POJOs. And uh, that doesn't really do anything. So in order to actually be able to implement this, you'd have to create a handler. So each command and each query has its own handler that actually performs this operation and then returns the result. And this handler, it contains a single method that accepts the command or query object as a parameter, and then it returns the result. And these handlers can be transactional. They can be implemented as, uh, for example, EGBs or CDI-managed beans or Spring-managed beans. In my example code that I'm going to show, I'm not using any of those. I'm actually implementing it myself, but that was just to keep it simple. Uh, similar queries and similar commands can share a common base class. So if you have a set of operations that are almost the same, you can use object-oriented programming to sort of inherit from basic command classes and add more details as you go down the hierarchy. And you can do the same in the command handler. So one handler can extend another handler. And a handler can also invoke another handler. So, so you can sort of uh, either extend or do composition with them. Uh, finding the correct handler, um, normally a client uh, doesn't really care where the handler is. The client only knows that now I, ha now I have this command or now I have this query, and I want to execute this command or I want to perform this query, and then it just gives it to the system that do this for me and give me the result. It doesn't care where this is. Uh, in order to do this, we have something called a, a broker or a gateway, depending on what you want to call it. So you have this one single object where you pass in your command or you pass in your query. And this object will then look up the correct handler in some way and invoke it and return the result. The advantage with this approach is, uh, first of all, it's an easy way of modeling the dynamics of the problem, problem domain. So you actually have to think about, uh, in, in, instead of just doing all the entities, you have to actually think, what operations do you have to do on these entities? Since you're modeling them as classes as well, you can do it in a separate a class diagram next to your static part. Then you really have to sort of think about it. Uh, for example, this is something that you can, uh, if you're doing UI design, it's a good idea to do the UI design in parallel with this, because then every, every UI operation, you realize that, oh, this corresponds to this business operation, then I probably need to add a command for that. Or then I need to add a query for this, because here we only have a small listing, here we have a bigger listing, I probably need two different queries, and so on. 
Uh, so this sort of uh, forces you to think in terms of the domain problem also while you're designing the UI. And uh, since the idea is that every UI operation invokes a single command or it invokes a single query, then the risk of you ending up implementing business logic in the UI is smaller than if you have like sort of a more generic service method. Since there is a, a there is a command in your domain layer that corresponds to this UI operation, then you might as well add the business logic there where it belongs in the backend. You can still, of course, uh, screw this up if you want to, but it sort of uh, it makes it slightly easier to avoid it. Uh, another thing is that your business logic, it's, it's, uh, instead of consisting of, of very big, large God classes, it will contain of, uh, consist of small, highly cohesive classes. If you have a complex UI, you will end up with a lot of these Handra classes. So you probably need to sort of think about your packaging. How are you going to turn it out, design your system into packages so that you don't get like a, several hundreds of handlers in a single package? Because then again, it's hard to find the correct class. This is also very easy to distribute. Since you basically what you're doing now is you're passing messages. You're passing one message, and you're expecting a message in return. And this makes it possible to, for example, replace your, re re your remoting protocol with, uh, uh, let's say, an AMQB message bus such as RabbitMQ, and do it completely asynchronous. So you're just sending a message to some service bus. The service bus knows how to route it to the correct server, performs the operation, sends the message back asynchronously, and then you get a call back when the operation is done. And especially if you, you serialize your commands, your queries, and your results to, for example, JSON, and then you add versioning, then you basically uh, made a system where you can support multiple versions of the same component at the same time using whatever technologies you want. You can have some .NET modules that implement some handlers. You could have Java that implements some handlers. You could have a native C++ implementation that does some really fast work. So if you construct your architecture in this way, this is a no, well, it's not a no-brainer. Of course, it's difficult, but it's easy to do, relatively easy to do. And you can even use uh, separate data sources for reading and writing. Um, have any one of you heard the term CQRS? Command query responsibility segregation. So this pattern is very much based on CQRS. Um, I think pure CQRS would probably sort of uh, draw a very distinctive wall between the query part and the command part so that the query wouldn't be allowed to know anything about the command part, so they wouldn't even be allowed to share entities. And whereas this model allows both queries and command handlers to be aware of, of, of the entities, so to speak. But uh, CQRS, uh, if you Google that term, you might find some. There are both videos and, and articles that they, they are telling something similar to this. Uh, for example, this is one way of, of, of separating the data sources. Uh, this is especially useful in a system where you're doing a few writes and lots and lots of reads. And you also have uh, this uh, eventual consistency. Then you can implement your system in this way. So you got the UI on top. And then we have uh, the layer between the UI and the backend. So that call to the broker, it could be a remote call. The broker knows about the query handlers. The broker knows about the command handlers. Those can either be deployed on the same machine, or they can be running on completely different servers. I don't care. Then we have a, a cluster data source. So for example, both MySQL and PostgreSQL, they support setups like this. It's pretty easy to set up. So basically, what you have is you have one master data that accepts all inserts, updates, and deletes. And this master data will automatically replicate itself to one or more slaves. And these slaves allow read-only queries. And this makes it possible to sort of uh, balance your queries. If you have a query, uh, uh, you have lots of queries in your system, then you can, instead of letting the master do all the work, you can split it up after, on many slaves. But if you have a separated 
If you've separated your query handlers and your command handlers, this is pretty easy to do because you just configure them with different data sources. If you have a single service that does this, then you'd have to sort of keep track of which entity manager instance am I going to use here and which entity manager I'm going to use there and which data source and so on. This makes it a lot easier. This is one, one trick that you can do, uh, and especially useful if you know that your system is going to be working with very large amounts of data. Uh, then, uh, well, even the best databases will clog down and become slower when the data uh, grows. And if you have a possibility to sort of split it up over more servers, then of course it's, it's better. The user performance will, will improve. Uh, naturally, uh, this isn't a one-size-fits-all uh, approach. It has some, some disadvantages as well, which is, again, why uh, you shouldn't necessarily go for this approach. This is probably not the number one approach in, in when you start a new project. It's one of the tools in the toolbox. So, uh, well, obviously, you've got some more boilerplate code to maintain. So for each uh, user operation, you have a command, and then you have a handler. So basically, you have lots of small classes instead of a few big ones. That's uh, one obvious problem. Uh, another problem uh, is uh, basically that the client doesn't invoke the handler directly. So, so if the handler is missing, you will only notice it during runtime. So if you're invoking a service, there is, is, there is a direct uh, dependency between the client and the service. And if the service interface is missing, when you compile it, you will get an error. In this case, uh, you only get errors uh, when you deploy the system. But uh, then again, if you're using EGBs with service, uh, service interfaces, uh, you have the same problem there. Uh, also, uh, there isn't any sort of ready-made command query framework, at least that I'm aware of, so you'd actually have to implement this yourself. Not hard, but something that you'd have to do. And it doesn't prevent you from making either two fine-grained commands or two coarse-grained commands, so you still need to know what you're doing. I'm sorry. Okay, so uh, enough talk. Um, I have about 10 minutes, a uh, little less than 10 minutes left, so I'm going to actually uh, show you some code. Uh, before I go to the code, this is the actual running application. Uh, it's a stupid, some kind of patient register. And down here, I have a form. I can add born, let's say, on Monday. Add patient. I can do queries. I can do filtering. So on, and uh, the point here is not the actual logic in this code. It's, uh, it's intentionally very silly and very simple. But uh, this command command implementation is probably the one that's that's more interesting. So, uh, can you all see? I think it's big enough. So this is basically my framework that I've implemented for this example. Um, so we got, uh, this is the command interface. It looks like that. I, I've added an, a, a message marker interface. So it doesn't contain any operations, but it's serializable in case I want to send this over the wire in some other format than JSON or XML. And then this is a result that I want to get back. And then you have this command, which is also a marker interface. I could just as well use this message interface, but this kind of makes it easier to understand if something is a command or something is a query. I could also just skip these interfaces and use some kind of suffix or package name. But this is how we're doing in this case. Query looks the same. Then I have this uh, query handler. Looks like this. So handle query uh, accepts a query as a parameter, returns a result. Command handler, same here, handle command. Then I have uh, commands, which is basically my broker for commands, and uh, queries, which is my brokers for queries. So these are the entry points into this framework. So I could also do this uh, as a single handler or single broker if I wanted to, but I think it's easier to keep them separate now. And how this is implemented is uh, 
if you're using CDI or Spring, you would obviously use component scanning and let CDI or Spring do this for you. Uh, but in this case, I wanted to keep it really, really, really simple. So I'm actually using uh, standard Java service loaders. So uh, in this case, if I have a broker, I will uh, initialize a Java service loader for all the handlers of a particular handler class. So uh, for the queries, I will get all the implementations of my query handler interface. And for the commands, I will get all the implementations from my command interface. And then over here, I have this find handler. So uh, for any command class, I will just loop through my command handlers, for example, and look for one that supports my message, because uh, it's even possible to have like multiple implementations for the same message. I don't know why you want to do that, but you can. And then I store it in a cache so that I don't need to loop through my list every single time. So then I can just do a, a simple a map query whenever I get a command, find a proper handler. And, and the, if this was some kind of remote system, then obviously this would be a lot more complex. Then you need to know sort of the URL of the remote services, and you probably need to keep track of whether the services are alive or if they are dead and, and so on. But anyway, this is really, really the simple, simple version. And then we have Minimize this sidebar too much. And then we have uh, commands, which basically just extends my broker interface. And the query does the same. So that's, that's the SPI. Uh, now if we look, now I'm going to go back to presentation mode. Now if, if we actually look at, at this this uh, business operations that I have. So I got uh, create patient, this is my command. So it implements command patient. Here we got the final attributes. And uh, if I wanted to, I could add some kind of validations here to make sure that the first name and last name are not null and the birth date is not in the future and so on. Then I got the handler. Looks like this. This is a really, really, really simple implementations. This is basically a CRUD implementation, but I didn't have time to come up with anything more fancy. So uh, we're creating a new patient object. I'm populating it. I'm saving it. I'm returning it. Uh, in a real world, I should probably do a lot more stuff here. Like uh, in Finland, you would probably have to print out a form where the patient would have to sign that he approves of you storing the personal data in your patient, repos patient repository and so on and so forth. So there would probably be a lot more stuff involved in this operation. But anyway, that's a, a patient handler. And then I have this find all patients query built in the same way, handler. Uh, this is, uh, since I didn't, this uh, patient repository here, it's an in-memory implementation. It doesn't contain any queries. So that's why I'm actually doing this filtering in line here. Uh, in a real application, you obviously wouldn't do this. You would transform this query object into a set of SQL or JPQL sets and then send them to your data stores and get back the result. This is how you'd sort of uh, implement your domain logic. And then in the UI, you invoke it like this. So I have this uh, filter button where I'm just, uh, where I have this find method. So I'm invoking queries, get instance, ask, find all patients, get the results back, and then I update the UI. Here's the same thing. Uh, when I need to add a new one, I just, it's a single line, uh, or actually this is two lines, but it's because it's wrapped. Anyway, it's a one-liner to actually invoke the business operation. And then I just, the rest is just UI code. So this is how you would do uh, a command and query based architecture in Vardin. And uh, before I finish, uh, there is uh, one more note I'd like to make. Uh, what about long running transactions? So if you have like something called a wizard or something, so uh, you have one UI operation that depends on the previous one, which depends on the previous one. How can you actually, oh, it's, uh, how can you actually uh, um, move this 
to your your business or backend layer instead of doing it in the UI. And uh, the way you're doing this with commands is to introduce a concept called a conversation. So uh, your commands are participating in the same conversation, and the conversation consists of many steps. And uh, one way, if you have like CDI, you could, for example, implement your own uh, conversation scope. I think JFaces have something like that. I don't know if it's working like this. Or you could just have some kind of conversation object that you basically pass from one command to the next, which contains the state from the previous command. So by doing this, you can actually have sort of a stateless, stateful uh, command-based uh, conversations in your backend, which consists of many UI steps without actually moving the logic to your UI layer. And uh, this is a bit more complex to implement. Uh, and uh, fortunately, I don't have an example for that. Uh, but uh, at least keep this in mind in case you sometimes run into a problem like this when you think that, hey, maybe this could be something that you could use. So, summary. Discipline versus patterns. So, uh, no pattern uh, will help you unless uh, your developers are sort of... Uh, if your developers are not disciplined, so you still need to sort of make sure you put the right code in the right place. Remember the transaction boundary. Strive for high cohesion, low coupling. Uh, separate reading and writing. Uh, not the number one thing, but keep it in mind. Sometimes it might be useful. Avoid CRUD unless that's actually what you need. You're doing administration views. And then uh, consider using comments and queries when you have a UI that's clearly business driven, that's uh, based on business operations instead of just uh, data operations. And that's all I had uh, to say about this topic. Uh, again, we're out of time, so write down any questions and we can do them in the QA session uh, later today. So, thank you.